Today I'm throwing um, what I call drip catches and they're basically these little discs that go under pieces in the kiln. Uh, a lot of people use slab rolled things and call them like cookies or kiln diapers or something like that. But um, the way I do them is slightly more involved but only slightly. So the idea is they're a flat plate with a slightly kicked up rim and a raised centre and um, the profile is something like that, you can see it, so kicked up and then a bit in the middle for the piece to stand on. The advantage over a flat diaper or whatever, kabuki or whatever you're going to call them, is that you get a piece like this where his drip goes below the bottom. Because he sits on the elevated centre part, he didn't stick and you can kind of keep rather than you'd either snap that off or you'd, um, you know, something. So if it was stuck to that, something would have to break. And if it had been a flat piece, it would have run underneath um, and probably cost you the piece. Whereas if it's raised just a fraction, it gives that little bit of extra space. The other thing I'm going to be throwing are these, similar principle, but they're what I use for firing the pour overs on. So I leave this um, circle where basically nothing happens, no coffee should be on that part, and I sit them on these in the kiln, which means that you can get a drip coming through the middle, will be caught by that. Um, you can position them quite easily, you can glaze the whole of the base part that's actually going to be used, and you just leave a band for them to sit on, like that. Um, the only, these are literally as you see, thrown, so you just literally smear the clay out, pull a, a centre bit up, and then the only thing is that the middle is trimmed afterwards, just a fraction, so that um, it sits on the outer bit rather than if it bowed ever so slightly, then it would rock. So that's literally all there is to it. Um, and they're very quick and easy to throw with about 100 to 200 grams of clay. Um, they take moments, and I just use reclaim. I don't even bother wedging it too well. It doesn't matter about throwing them perfectly by any means. Also, they're reusable. People often ask how many times can you use them. And basically, actually you can see with this versus, say, that, how much glossier it is. And that's um, partly down to how many times it's been fired. Probably 20 times by now. They either get covered in glaze and then become unusable because of that or they'll crack, or um, they'll start to uh, bloat and bubble up. And then the other thing, I was just going to show just because it's very useful for these, is my modified CD rack. Got this um, from a charity shop, and cut it open slightly so that it'll fit my larger bats, but you can stack, well, all 20 in. If you're throwing really flat things, you just stack them and then they don't take up loads of room, which they would do otherwise. Um, so yeah, all I do to throw them is, it's like you're throwing a plate, but really rough and ready. So. You just want to smear the clay out like that. And so you've now got a flat surface. And then the only bit that matters whether or not it's level is the bit the piece will stand on. So this is where the hole in the middle comes in and the raised centre. By making the whole thing flat, you've left spare clay in the middle that actually you don't need because it doesn't do anything for normal pieces. They're not going to drip from the centre out. Um, so what I do is just open to the centre, pull that bit out, and this is where you want to make sure this bit's nice and smooth and actually level, because that's where the piece will sit. Uh, and then I raise a slight lip on the outer edge. Not really, I mean, you really shouldn't flood that with glaze. Um, the outer lip just makes it easier to pick up. If you've ever picked up like a, a dinner plate versus a coaster or something that's got no lip on the edge, you'll know 
how much easier it is if you can get underneath it. Um, and I load the kiln with them already on there, um, the drip catchers. So I, I work out what the right drip catcher is and then load the two of them positioned together, which means that I'm holding the drip catcher most of the time. And that lip just makes it so much easier. Right, so that was a drip catcher. And then this is how I do the pour over uh, stands. They're not, I don't think, I don't know, maybe once or twice, but generally speaking, these don't actually catch any drips because generally speaking, I don't put so much glaze on the pour overs that they run. If there is a drip coming out of that center bit, it does actually often impair the functions. It's not, it's hard to, to clean that up and keep it as a good, sellable, usable piece. Um, but in, Possible. The main thing is just giving a way of being able to load them into the kiln um, such that you can glaze them the way you want and they won't stick. So on the basis that where this contacts you're um, going to leave unglazed you want it to be relatively sharp. If you had a big flat area, which the first ones I threw did, um, you either have to wax resist a larger area or you risk if it's fractionally off center, um, the glaze will stick to it. And again, it's hard to correct that. So once you've got it about right, level it off. And then again, this outer bit, um, having it a bit larger and a bit lifted makes it much easier to maneuver the whole thing into place in the kiln. Um, not essential, you can have it literally go straight down from the side, but if you've loaded the kiln and then want to shuffle it sideways or something like that, or just, to be honest, just in the loading of the kiln, um, it does make it much more comfortable if it's got that lip. And then what I'll do with these is they just literally dry on the bat until they pop off. So that rack I'm currently loading in horizontally, but it's got to stand up otherwise they'd slide off. But um, you get, once they're released from the bat, the uh, pour over ones, the bottom won't be so dry you can't trim it for a little while. So just the next day, once they've popped off, flip them over, trim from the center out just a fraction so they don't rock. Um, and that's it, throw them in the same clay that you use for the work, or you could use something like a high fire porcelain would probably survive repeat firings better because if, it's, if you're firing the cone 6 and you're using the clay for cone 10, um, then obviously kind of the repeated heat work um, that isn't going to affect it the same way. Over, you're over-firing a cone 6 clay once it's been in a few times. Cone 10, probably still not vitrified. So if you've got a cone 10 clay and it's... It, you really want it to be lighter than the clay you throw with, or the same. You don't want to use a dark clay for these and a white. You had like a, a porcelain, you threw in porcelain and then you used a black clay. What you get is that some of the colour from the darker clay would probably transfer because it will be things like, well, the contaminants will be iron and manganese making the clays darker. And they do volatilize in the kiln and you will get kind of staining of things around them. So, just worth bearing that in mind if you've got a clay that would show it up. Yeah, just rattle through a few of these. I don't bother weighing the clay out uh, particularly well. They're just a roll a wedgeable and just scrunch handfuls of it. So each one's somewhere between 100 and 200 grams. It's worth having a range of sizes anyway, because different pieces will want different kind of center widths for the support and then outer which is widths to catch. So yeah, just churn through a few of them, but that's how I make them and why.